There are now over 100 million people forced from their homes around the world, more than at any time in modern history. These are people who have fled extreme danger, whether to escape the relentless bombing, an invading army, gang violence, or other life-threatening circumstances. Back in Myanmar, my father was a farmer, and he also went fishing. Along with my siblings, I used to attend school regularly. I was in grade two when we left. We used to learn Burmese literature in school. But it all came to an end the day our house got burnt. The houses in our village were on fire. We couldn't run to the jungle, but we see it was on fire too. We fled to another village, but that village was also attacked. We were stranded, so we fled again to a canal and stayed there for two days with no food. We made it across the border, and now we live here in the camps. I like being a leader. At the centre, I get the children together and ask them to follow me when I'm doing the actions. I tell them, please, I'm going to start reciting the poem, so follow me. I'm a good boy and a quick learner. I also make other children laugh. It's fun. I want to learn more and more because I want to become a teacher when I grow up. We are from around Kiev. When the war broke out, we were not only afraid of bombings, we knew that the only way for our son to function normally was to go to Poland, where doctors were always available. Our son, Sasha, has just turned 15. Since he was two years old, he has been moving in a wheelchair. He suffers from SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. He is a bright boy who is interested in everything related to the internet. He is studying remotely in a Ukrainian school and will soon have a well-deserved vacation. When the war broke out, we didn't think long. We quickly packed our bags and moved to Poland, knowing that good people there would help us start a new life. We escaped from Ukraine during the heaviest shooting. The journey to Poland took four days. There is no place on earth we cannot leave to make our son's life easier. We were able to take a few pictures from our home in Ukraine. The rest is in our hearts and heads. I got interested initially when I was in Australia. I don't know if you'd heard about it, but around the year, must have been about the year 2000, there was a big kind of, I guess, yeah, a humanitarian disaster in the UK. There was a big boat, a big ship, that rescued migrants that were on a boat, the Tampa. John Howard was the Prime Minister at the time, conservative, very protectionist, really wanted to close borders, etc. And he basically wanted to make an example of this boat to say that we're going to be tough on migrants. We're not going to allow these Q-jumpers, he used to call them Q-jumpers, to enter our protected island country. And so he basically kept the ship out there on the sea for days. I can't even remember how long. I don't think it went into weeks, but definitely days. It got to the point where people were jumping overboard trying to swim to shore. They were throwing children off board in order to get them off the boat to swim to shore. The narrative turned against refugees saying, look at them, look at these, these I don't know, ridiculous people that think, think that's, a, that's actually a good thing to do, to throw their babies overboard. 
when we get refugees, like when I am kind of like involved in it, it's usually cases of TB since I'm in rest, which is very common in refugees, especially if they're coming from countries with a high incidence of TB, and most of them are, and spending a lot of time in close quarters on a boat. Obviously, that is a breeding ground for TB, so usually we get these. They'll be very young, sometimes like 19, 20, 21 years old, and they come in and they have to be seen for medical procedures. It really makes you think, kind of like, what a bubble we live in. These people have literally run for their lives, just packed a bag and just fled without family. The last thing I remember of Syria before we left was when my mother was taking me from our place to our grandparents. The roads were full of dead corpses. I saw dead people with no heads, no hands or legs. I was so shocked I couldn't stop crying. To calm me down, my grandfather told me they were mean people, but I still prayed for them, because even if some considered them mean, they were still dead human beings. Back at home, I left a friend in Syria. Her name was Rua. I miss her a lot, and I miss going to school with her. I used to play with her with my Atari, but I couldn't bring it with me. I also used to have pigeons, and one of them had eggs. I would feed them and care for them. I'm worried about them. I really pray someone is still caring for them. But here I have a small kitten that I really love. I miss my home a lot. I hope one day we'll be back and things will be just like before. You don't even know their names, as in, most of them don't even have documentation. Most of them have gotten rid of their passports because they don't want to be sent back. So, even if they have some form of documentation, they're not willing to give it up, or they've actually destroyed it. So most of them don't even have a name, technically, on our system. They're given numbers. It's usually like Mr. X and numbers. There's a whole database on our system of Mr. X's and numbers. I mean, some end up giving their name like if they've been there a long time, especially the ones who understand a bit of English or some of them who speak a bit of French as well. We tell them kind of like as medics, you know, we don't care about the politics or law behind this. It's not our business. We are farmers and today we are a family of six. Two years ago in Rahine, Myanmar, the army started arresting older men. My son, Ersha Dilla, was 20 years old then. We were all hiding in our houses and could not go anywhere, not even to collect food. One day the army came to our house and started taking my 16 year old daughter with them. My son came out of hiding to intervene. They shot him dead. We had to flee. It is safe in the camps. We can fast here and pray. At least the Myanmar army will not come in the night and arrest us. But Myanmar is my homeland. That's where all my ancestors are buried. You can all go home, but I cannot. We have to stay in a small hut in a camp.
I dream of my home when I sleep. One day we will return to Myanmar or maybe some other country where there is peace. The state of the asylum accommodation is so bad and so unsafe and individual needs and vulnerabilities are not taken into account at all. Well, they say they are, but they're not really. There was a trafficked person who preferred to make themselves homeless and sleep on a park bench in the middle of winter rather than return to his asylum accommodation because it was so unsafe. He was being targeted by people in the home and the accommodation had bedroom doors that don't lock so he doesn't even have the safety of his own room. I suppose I see my role as carrying those stories. Wherever I meet a home office official, telling them so that they know, because the home office are so removed. They move people around all the time and we're often dealing with people who have just come from education or, or come from the Ministry of Defence. So, you know, these people have no idea and so in every meeting I have, I try to make sure I tell this story of the person who preferred to make themselves homeless. I tell them about, you know, people that have to literally make choices between eating or powering their phone so they can call their family. Like, what kind of choice is that, that you're making people make? Like, they have to decide whether they're going to keep in touch with their family this week or feed themselves because of the amount of money that they are given. And so that is my role, to take that burden. Take that and, and shove it in the face of the home office so that they realize what they're doing. Most of them sadly don't speak English and don't understand English. And I mean, they're already traumatized because they've spent I mean, they've done God knows what to get on a boat, to spend God knows how long at sea, and God knows what conditions. And then they come to a place where they don't understand the language, and they're kind of taken to hospital, isolated in a room, because if you have symptoms of having TB, you go into isolation. And then you have someone coming in and trying to explain to you that, like, we're going to stab your chest because because there's fluid around it. I mean, usually there are translators, but sometimes they're not there. So it's a bit of like charade slash, you remember me, like, and what I was talking about before. I used to have a peaceful life and live in my amazing home in Dera. I enjoyed the nature around my house and the food coming from the land. I woke up every morning to the sound of birds singing. The brutality of the civil war forced my family to leave this house and to start the journey to be refugees. Since the start of our journey, we moved a lot in Lebanon and I attended different schools. In the end, my family decided to go close to the border with Syria. We came to this area because we, we just want to survive. My father is working as an electrician and this is the only income for our family. All of my family, we are living in a tiny house with one bedroom, a small kitchen and a bathroom. We are considered illegal because we don't have official documents. I am behind two years in school because of moving from one school to another. I'm still doing very good in my school and I will continue to do that. I want to finish my education to help my family and to help other people who want to learn. I consider myself lucky to have Al Jalil Center. I got a lot of educational, emotional and psychological support. I am also really sad because of the unknown future waiting for me. 
Every day I wonder where I will be tomorrow. Yes, it's an unknown future. <coughs> I argue with my parents all the time about this issue. I guess I can understand their point of view some of the time. For me, as a volunteer with these refugees, all I ever experienced was kindness and generosity. The fact that they would always offer me water or rice as a volunteer in the camp overwhelmed me. They'd always be like, come, please have. And I'm like, I want to give you, not you give me things. I don't know. So when I speak to my parents and tell them these things, it always ends in an argument. Because I try to challenge them, and I can try to correct the inaccurate false claims. But they still just believe what they see on social media, rather than going out and actually speaking to the people themselves. I think we have to be more responsible to actually just really listen. Like if some people are concerned about jobs or resources or what's happening to their local community with more people coming in, then that's, that's a valid concern. It doesn't mean it's by default racist. So I think it's also just about listening a little bit better and just trying to understand what is, what's the basis of this concern that they're having and let's actually try to discuss that, as opposed to just dismiss them or shut them down. Otherwise, they'll continue to blame the migrant and not the government policies. The stories you heard today are all very real experiences told by Jakob, Victoria, Vova, Kat, Sarah, Alia, Nunaha, Abdul, Shafak, and Zoe. They are stories about real people who are looking for a home and a safe place to be, perhaps in your continent, your country, or your hometown. They could be the people next door, the person on the bus, the friendly face you smiled at today. would be just like before. You don't even know their names, as in most of them don't even have documentation. Most of them have gotten rid of their passports because they don't want to be sent back. So even if they have some form of documentation, they're not willing to give it up, or they've actually destroyed it. So most of them don't even have a name, technically, on our system. They're given numbers. It's usually like Mr. X and numbers. There's a whole database on our system of Mr. X's and numbers. I mean, some end up giving their name like if they've been there a long time, especially the ones who understand a bit of English or some of them who speak a bit of French as well. We tell them kind of like as medics, you know, we don't care about the politics or law behind this. It's not our business.
we are farmers and today we are a family of six. Two years ago in Rohine, Myanmar, the army started arresting older men. My son, Ersha Dala, was 20 years old then. We were all hiding in our houses and could not go anywhere, not even to collect food. One day the army came to our house and started taking my 16 year old daughter with them. My son came out of hiding to intervene. They shot him dead. We had to flee. It is safe in the camps. We can fast here and pray. At least the Myanmar army will not come in the night and arrest us. But Myanmar is my homeland. That's where all my ancestors are buried. You can all go home, but I cannot. We have to stay in a small hut in a camp. I dream of my home when I sleep. One day we will return to Myanmar or maybe some other country where there is peace. The state of the asylum accommodation is so bad and so unsafe and individual needs and vulnerabilities are not taken into account at all. Well, they say they are, but they're not really. There was a trafficked person who preferred to make themselves homeless and sleep on a park bench in the middle of winter rather than return to his asylum accommodation because it was so unsafe. He was being targeted by people in the home and the accommodation had bedroom doors that don't lock, so he doesn't even have the safety of his own room. I suppose I see my role as carrying those stories. Whenever I meet a home office official, telling them so that they know, because the home office are so removed. They move people around all the time and we're often dealing with people who have just come from education or, or come from the Ministry of Defence. So, you know, these people have no idea. And so in every meeting I have, I try to make sure I tell this story of the person who preferred to make themselves homeless. I tell them about you know, people that have to literally make choices between eating or powering their phone so they can call their family. Like, what kind of choice is that, that you're making people make? Like, they have to decide whether they're going to keep in touch with their family this week or feed themselves because of the amount of money that they are given. And so that is my role, to take that burden. Take that... And, and shove it in the face of the home office so that they realize what they're doing. Most of them sadly don't speak English and don't understand English. And I mean, they're already traumatized because they've spent, I mean, they've done God knows what to get on a boat to spend God knows how long at sea, and God knows what conditions. And then they come to a place where they don't understand the language, and they're kind of taken to hospital, isolated in a room, because if you have symptoms of having TB, you go into isolation. And then you have someone coming in and trying to explain to you that like, we're gonna stab your chest because, because there's fluid around it. I mean, Usually there are translators, but sometimes they're not there. So it's a bit of like charade slash, you remember me, like, and what I was talking about before. I used to have a peaceful life and live in my amazing home in Dera. I enjoyed the nature around my house and the food coming from the land. I woke up every morning to the sound of birds singing. The brutality of the civil war forced my family to leave this house and to start the journey to be refugees.
Since the start of our journey, we moved a lot in Lebanon, and I attended different schools. In the end, my family decided to go close to the border with Syria. We came to this area because we, we just want to survive. My father is working as an electrician, and this is the only income for our family. All of my family, we are living in a tiny house with one bedroom, a small kitchen, and a bathroom. We are considered illegal because we don't have official documents. I am behind two years in school because of moving from one school to another. I'm still doing very good in my school and I will continue to do that. I want to finish my education to help my family and to help other people who want to learn. I consider myself lucky to have Al Jalil Center. I got a lot of educational, emotional and psychological support. I am also really sad because of the unknown future waiting for me. Every day I wonder where I will be tomorrow. Yes, it's an unknown future. I argue with my parents all the time about this issue. I guess I can understand their point of view some of the time. For me, as a volunteer with these refugees, all I ever experienced was kindness and generosity. The fact that they would always offer me water or rice as a volunteer in the camp overwhelmed me. They'd always be like, come, please have. And I'm like, I want to give you, not you give me things. I don't know. So when I speak to my parents and tell them these things, it always ends in an argument because I try to challenge them and I can try to correct the inaccurate false claims, but they still just believe what they see on social media rather than going out and actually speaking to the people themselves. I think we have to be more responsible to actually just really listen like if some people are concerned about jobs or resources or what's happening to their local community with more people coming in, then that's, that's a valid concern. It doesn't mean it's by default racist. So I think it's also just about listening a little bit better and just trying to understand what is, what's the basis of this concern that they're having. And let's actually try to discuss that as opposed to just dismiss them or shut them down. Otherwise, they'll continue to blame the migrants and not the government policies. The stories you heard today are all very real experiences told by Jakob, Victoria, Vova, Kat, Sarah, Alia, Nunaha, Abdul, Shafak and Zoe. They are stories about real people who are looking for a home and a safe place to be, perhaps in your continent, your country, or your hometown. They could be the people next door, the person on the bus, the friendly face you smiled at today. Should be meant for older 